All right, open up your Bibles, please, to Numbers chapter 17. And I'm going to read just all of 17 this morning. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and get from them staffs, one for each father's house from all their chiefs, according to their father's houses, twelve staffs. Write each man's name on his staff and write Aaron's name on the staff of Levi. But there shall be, for there shall be one staff for the head of each father's house. Then you shall deposit them in the tent of meeting before the ceremony where I meet with you. And the staff of the man whom I choose shall sprout. This I will make to cease, thus rather, I will make to cease from me the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against you. Moses spoke to the people of Israel, and all their chiefs gave him staffs, one for each chief, according to their father's houses, twelve staffs, and the staff of Aaron was among their staffs. And Moses deposited the staffs before the Lord in the tent of the testimony. On the next day, Moses went into the tent of the testimony, and behold, the staff of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth buds and produced blossoms, and it bore ripe almonds. Then Moses brought out all the staffs from before the Lord to all the people of Israel, and they looked, and each man took his staff. And the Lord said to Moses, Put back the staff of Aaron before the testimony, to be kept as a sign for the rebels, that you may make an end of their grumblings against me, lest they die. Thus Moses did as the Lord commanded him, so he did. And the people of Israel said to Moses, Behold, we perish, we are undone, we are all undone. Everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Are we all to perish? Interesting reaction, right? I suppose there are probably a lot of different ways uh, that you could vindicate somebody. Psalm 23 gives us a pretty creative, beautiful picture of of vindication. The the psalmist says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. That's quite a beautiful and creative picture of vindication. God honoring a person with a feast right in front of his enemies. Blessing someone in these tangible ways right in front of those who had opposed him. It's kind of God's way of saying, look, uh, you have been against him, but he has my favor. And I am lavishing my grace upon him. I'm honoring him with my presence to show you that he has my favor and my grace. It certainly gets the point across, right? It's a beautiful and brilliant picture of vindication. But honestly, I think there has to be no greater, more amazing picture of vindication, or at least I would say one of the greatest pictures of vindication that has ever, ever been Aaron's budding staff. I mean, who would even think of such a beautiful and creative, clever way of vindicating someone. It is not only beautiful, but it is full of implications, spiritual implications. In chapter 17, God vindicates and encourages his discouraged servants with the blossoming of Aaron's rod. He is proving the point that they did not take the priesthood upon themselves. They were given this duty by God himself. And God is vindicating the ministry of Moses and Aaron, and he's telling future generations in those blossoms and in those buds that all true ministry comes from God himself. 
God tells Moses in verse 5 of chapter 17 the point of the miracle to show the people who God chose for the priesthood and in doing so, as he puts it, to cease from me the grumblings of the people of Israel which they grumble against you. He was speaking to Moses, so it was to vindicate the ministry of both Moses and Aaron and to end this rebellion and the uprising against them both. This incident in chapter 17 finally concludes the story of the rebellion of Korah and his crew. Certainly they had been dealt with pretty definitively. Uh, it's probably not even enough to say that they were punished. They certainly were, but you don't get a more definitive punishment than having the earth swallow you up. Uh, they were just removed. Israel didn't even have to bury those people. God buried them. He took care of it himself. Uh, they were just gone. And while the emphasis there in chapter 16 is um, highly negative, to say the least, here in 17, the emphasis is most certainly positive and beautiful with a life-giving picture. You know, we can just never, ever, ever, ever stop being overwhelmed by the wisdom and the kindness and the beauty of God. It seems to me that gigantic issues like this one, the constant uprising and rebelling that the people demonstrated against Moses and Aaron and ultimately against the Lord, required not only punishment and some kind of force, but also some convincing, reasonable proof as well. And God, in his miraculous grace, has given both the judgment of Korah and then can you think of a more elegant miracle than the budding of Aaron's staff? This twofold act of God, the judgment against Korah and the unmistakable seal of approval God places on Aaron's priesthood was meant to put an end to their persistent murmurings against God and his servants. But sadly, some people are not convinced by the truth, regardless of how beautifully and thoroughly uh, and poetically it is presented. In fact, um, the fact that Aaron's rod produced blossoms, buds, and almonds, and not just almonds, but actually ripe almonds, is a stunning miracle with so many spiritual implications, and I want to talk about just a few of them. First of all, something obviously happened to Aaron's rod, right, that did not happen to the other staffs. He was singled out and shown to be different from the others. He was clearly God's choice. And it's interesting that it was the rod that was chosen in this demonstration. The rod signified authority. It was Aaron's authority, after all, that had been called into question during the rebellion of chapter 16. The authority of Aaron and his descendants to be the only priests in Israel. The rod of Moses from Exodus 4 became the symbol of divine authority in the hands of Moses. Uh, when he lifted up that staff, it was apparent to everybody around him that he was representing God himself. He was acting on behalf of God and he stood in the position of spokesperson carrying the authority of God himself. When Aaron's rod, the symbol of priestly authority, was laid before the sanctuary of God, it budded and produced life. It produced almond buds, <coughs> blossoms, not only blossoms, but actually ripe almonds, which could have been eaten. They were food. It says a lot more than it appears. This was God's way of saying that his authority, as it was vested in the priesthood in Aaron and in his disciple, dis descendants rather alone, was a living reality, a living authority. 
And when submitted to and obeyed, it would produce life and health and sustenance for the people of Israel. To rebel against Aaron's authority was to rebel against God's. God produced life on that staff. And the priesthood under Aaron would be a source of life and blessing to the people of Israel. You remember back in chapter 16, verse 46, Aaron uh, very dramatically ran into the crowd with the incense, right? And he stopped the plague. He demonstrated at that moment that he carried with him God's power of life. And the irony doesn't go unnoticed, I'm sure, that the one man whose authority had been so terribly challenged was actually the one man who could stop the plague in that moment and bring life to the people of Israel. Aaron had indeed budded and blossomed as a blessing to his people, and he was the one chosen. It was through Aaron that God was bringing life to the people. Now, he was not perfect, right? He had his faults, for sure. But he carried with him the seal of God upon his life, and he was fruitful in his sovereign purpose. The sign from God was meant to silence once and for all the murmurings and the silent revolt that laid in their hearts. All of the coveting of the priesthood should come to an end. Uh, keep in mind that there were not only almonds for the present moment, but there were promising buds and blossoms for the future as well. So from Aaron's home, from his sons, would come future priests. Aaron was the almond. The blossoms were his sons being prepared for future responsibilities. And the buds represented generations to come, the children who would take their place one day. And so it is with us. Christ has provided in his church those seeds of fruitfulness and faithfulness that will serve him from generation to generation until Christ returns. So that reminds us that we need to be thinking about our own homes, about our own little buds. We gotta be praying for, uh, fruit, for the future blossoms and buds that will take your place. You're the fruit, you're the almond. We need to be praying for those those little buds and blossoms. The almond tree has great significance for the children of Israel. It's used a number of times in the Old Testament, including Jeremiah's prophecy in Jeremiah 1.11. Remember that the cups of the lampstand in the tabernacle were shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms. The almond blossom was an important symbol for the people of Israel perhaps because it is the first of the flowering plants to blossom, blossoming in midwinter, in February, and even sometimes in January. They called it the watcher because it indicates God's watching over them during the bleak winter. And in the case of Aaron's budded staff, it may indicate God's watchfulness during the bleak winter of their disobedience. In this miracle, God shows Aaron that Aaron is God's chosen man, and the sons of Aaron are to be the priests in Israel. This is God verifying Aaron's ministry and vindicating him and upholding both Aaron's authority as priest of Israel, but also God's authority as Lord over all, as the author of all things. He is the one who gets to decide who represents him, and how we are to approach him. God's miraculous sign, although it is dressed in elegant beauty, is a clear warning. He's saying, this is my chosen person. Do not mess with him. He's saying to the people of Israel what he says in Psalm 105, 15, do not touch my anointed ones, and do no harm to my prophets. You know, I think sometimes we have a little bit, at least I do, a little bit of a uh, Sunday school understanding of certain things from the Old Testament. And, and we think of that 
Ark of the Covenant containing those three things, the manna, the tablets, and Aaron's budded rod. And we think, how sweet that is. That's so nice. It's such a beautiful symbol of what happened there. The manna represents God's provision in the wilderness. The, the tablets represent God's law. And Aaron's staff represents his priestly authority and God's authority over all. So as sweet as it is, it's also a very clear warning to God's people to remember that he is the one who has ultimate authority and not to challenge him. We all understand that the central theme of the Old Testament scriptures is that they point to Christ. They are a foreshadowing, a witness to the coming of Christ. So we see in this story a type of foreshadowing of Christ, our great high priest. The eternal priesthood of Jesus is challenged by so many people who will not bow to his authority. And God has vindicated his eternal priesthood by raising Jesus from the dead. That's even cooler than a budded staff. The resurrection is, in a sense, the budding and blossoming of the almond all over again. Jesus' ministry was vindicated by God himself. John's Gospel says that. It says that Jesus was sent by the Father, sent from God. It was God who gave Jesus authority. Ultimately, Jesus does not bear witness to himself, but the Father and the Spirit bear witness to him. Jesus says in John 5, 31 and 32, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony he bears about me is true. Jesus says that he is sent from God, not simply by claiming it himself, but by God confirming it with signs. Uh, Peter says something very similar in Acts 2.22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. In other words, Peter is reiterating what has been established in the Gospel of John that it is not just that Jesus made these bold claims, it's that he has been attested to by God himself to be who he claimed to be. Just as Aaron was attested to be God's priest by God's miraculous sign, revealing and showing publicly that God had chosen Aaron. God is saying in Aaron's budding staff that he alone chooses the way in which we can enter into fellowship with him. He alone chooses his mediator. Nobody can wake up one day and say, you know what, I really think I'd like to be God's mediator. Because that person in and of himself has no saving power. The reason God appoints is that only God can save. Only the one he chooses has saving power because, of course, that power comes from the Lord. The world loves to tell us that there are many ways to God, but there is no saving power apart from the one that God has appointed to save. We cannot redeem ourselves. We can do nothing to save ourselves. Nobody can wake up and say they want to be God's mediator because we are the problem. We are the objects of salvation. We are the saved the ones who get saved. He is the solution. We are the problem. The miracle of the budding rod was meant to silence the people of their constant murmuring and complaining, their constant challenging of the authority of God. It was to put an end to the rebellion of people toward God. And for a little while, it did that, but not forever. So this was really a token. It was to point forward to that one great miracle which does give the final answer to the problem of sin. 
and to man's rebellion against God, it would point forward to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the rod, the staff, that was laid alone and barren before in the sanctuary of God, facing God's wrath, facing the wrath of God for the entire world. That's what was laid on him alone. But he emerged from that tomb with the buds and the blossoms of the newness of life and the nourishment, the almonds, the sustenance of his sanctifying presence. God has vindicated Christ by raising him from the dead. Paul says so in Acts 17, 31. In his death and resurrection, he did put an end to the rebellion of people and brought that full and final eternal reconciliation between God and man. Hallelujah. That same future grace, that's how John Piper describes it, uh, that is demonstrated in this budding staff is also illustrated in the purifying effects of the red heifer in chapter 19. Now, I don't have too much more time to spend on these remaining chapters, but I just want to point out a couple of things. Uh, the response of the people at the end of chapter 17 when they say we are undone, we're going to die, that's a little bit weird, you know? You kind of read that and don't quite know what to make of it. On one hand, at least they were finally getting it that uh, this was serious, that God's authority was ultimate, and that their lives could be in jeopardy, right, if they did not obey. At least they were sort of tasting the, the seriousness, the somberness of that. Uh, but at the same time, they sort of missed the point. Here God had provided this beautiful sign of the newness of life. And he's telling them that if you would just surrender and submit to this authority, to my authority, then you will experience newness of life. Uh, that response at the end of chapter 17, that we're going to die phrase, is really the link between 17 and 18. The people had rebelled against God, and they knew it. And they had desired the priesthood for themselves. So God paints a pretty clear picture of the priesthood for them here in chapter 18. And it shows them that this is something that's not really worthwhile coveting, right? Uh, he lays out the responsibilities of the priesthood as a warning against wanting that office. He's showing them that, look, this is not quite as fun as it looks on the outside. It appears to be terribly dignified and full of honor on the outside, but it carries a lot of heavy, unglamorous responsibilities on the inside. And that, of course, is what people always fail to see when they covet, right? Uh, there are three groups of people that these uh, chapters speak to. There are basically three groups of people in all of Israel, priests, Levites, and everybody else, the people. Each of them is addressed here in these chapters. The regulations for priests and Levites in chapter 18, and then the laws for purification for everybody else in chapter 19. Now you might think it's a little bit weird that God spends so much time in chapter 19 talking about what you do when you come into contact with the dead. But I suspect that the reason for that is that they were going to be coming into contact with a lot of dead. They had just, they had just lost 14,700 people, right, in the plague. And God had told them that the entire generation would die off in the wilderness. So they would be confronting a lot of death, and they needed to know how to handle it. And the sacrifice of the red heifer is God's answer to their problem the defilement of death. Uh, the sacrifice of the red heifer in chapter 19 was different from every other sacrifice described in the Old Testament. It is unique. First of all, the animal itself was different. It was not a bull or a goat or a lamb, but a red heifer, a young cow, a female, who has not given birth yet. Once she gives birth, she's considered a cow. I learned that. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm kind of proud of that, but I know that. 
She was without defect and had no yoke yet. No yoke had come upon her. She was young. She had been taken. She was taken outside of the camp to be killed in the presence of a priest, but not at the altar as most other sacrifices were. And then the carcass of the animal was to be burned entirely. None of it was offered to God. It was not consumed by the priests. And the ashes were collected and used for future use. And that is sort of the key word, future. When someone came into contact with a dead body, then these ashes would be mixed with water, and a clean person, an undefiled person, would dip hyssop in the mixture and sprinkle it on the person or the thing that had become ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. The defilement of death was so pervasive that even a vessel left uncovered in the same tent as a dead body would be considered unclean. And this is a picture of the widespread defilement of sin. Numbers 19 focuses specifically on defilement from contact with the dead, but what does that represent spiritually? It represents any dead thing. The deadness that sin brings, the wages of sin, is death, right? Everything in this ordinance points to Christ. The red of the heifer pointing to the blood of Jesus. The heifer is taken outside of the camp as Jesus was taken outside of the camp. The cleansing was based on the slaying of the animal on atonement, that substitutionary nature of atonement, the death of another as the substitute for our sin, just like Jesus. The heifer was without defect or blemish as Jesus was without sin. But we learn something else very interesting in verse 9. Basically, it tells us that a death in the past <coughs> continues to have cleansing effect in the future. Now, other sacrifices were to atone for a particular sin in the immediate, in the now. So if you lied, which I know is inconceivable that any of you would ever do that, but if you were to happen to lie, you would confess your sin and make a sacrifice, and that sacrifice would atone for that sin. And then the next time that you become cognizant of your sin, you have to do it again. So it was constant and ongoing. But this sacrifice was different. It was used for defilement in the future. Cleansing was applied at the time the sacrifice was offered, but then even after the sacrifice was offered, and in some cases long after the sacrifice of that heifer, when the ashes of the heifer were poured into the waters of purification and applied to people and things, long after the sacrifice had been made, it still has cleansing of power. So a death in the past has cleansing effects for the future. Does that sound like anyone you know? It points to the once and for all nature of Christ's death. Christ's sacrifice. Hebrews 27, Hebrews 7, rather, 27, says Jesus has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sin, and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered himself up. The efficacy of Christ's cleansing power is not tied to the time in which it was offered. Christ was crucified over 2,000 years ago, and his sacrifice still has saving, cleansing power for us right now in 2023. And it had cleansing power for these people who lived in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, as they looked forward to the promise of the coming Messiah and this heifer was to help them see that. That there was one coming who would be living outside of time such that his sacrifice would be efficacious past, present, and future. And in number 
verse 19, only an undefiled person could administer the ashes. Jesus is that undefiled person. Everyone involved in the process of decontamination becomes defiled himself. The priest, the one who gathers the ashes, who burns the ashes, everybody involved in the process becomes unclean and then has to go through their own ritual clean, cleaning, <laughs> cleanliness, whatever you call it. But Jesus is the undefiled person who remains clean. You remember a few weeks ago we talked about Luke chapter 8 when Jesus healed the woman with a discharge. Now touching a woman who was menstruating would have made you unclean. He healed her and did not become unclean. Jesus raised Jairus' 12-year-old daughter from the dead. He took her by the hand. He touched her dead body. He raised her to life. And he did not become unclean. He remains clean. You see, he absorbs our sin. And he bears our sin. But he does not become unclean himself. Praise God that we have one who can cleanse us without becoming unclean himself. There was also something that this red heifer could not do. Hebrews 9, 13 and 14 says, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The heifer could make you ritually unclean, but it could not ever cleanse your conscience. Jesus cleanses the conscience, which is a miracle of miracles. Praise God. Father, we thank you. We thank you, thank you, thank you for this incredible book. Thank you for numbers. Thank you for the truth that it shows us. Thank you for the budded staff. Thank you for vindicating Aaron's priesthood. But mostly thank you for vindicating Jesus' eternal priesthood by raising him from the dead. Thank you for the blood of this, for the ashes of this heifer that shows us the cleansing power of Christ that is efficacious past, present, and future. Praise you. Thank you for Jesus. Your plan is perfect. No one could ever make this up. It's too incredible. Praise 